the momentum and impulse. I really like this picture here. Why science teachers should not be given playground duty. You ever seen those little sort of the metal uh, spheres? You know, so they go like bang, bang, bang. That has to do with conservation and momentum. Uh, <laughs> that would be awesome if you did that. I don't know why I laugh at that. Maybe I have kids. I could just imagine that. They'd be laughing their butts off, that's for sure. So we have something called momentum. And it seems like a really strange thing. I mean, we understand mass, I think, right? Most people get mass. Uh, and mass is something that's measured in kilograms. I'll put the units here. And velocity is measured in meters per second. That's something we can measure. Now, a lot of people think, why do we have momentum? Well, it turns out momentum is a really weird uh, sounding thing, uh, but it's really useful. First of all, the equation for momentum goes like this, P equals MV. That's the equation you get. This is the vector and that's a vector. Super important. Um, and yet a lot of people think it's really strange. So what I mean by that is, that, I mean, this is in your data booklet, by the way. So this thing called momentum, let's look at the units for it, by the way. You don't have to memorize them. Let's look. Momentum is, let's see, what's mass measured in again? Oh, yeah, kilograms. So that's why it's measured in kilograms. And then uh, velocity, which is meters per second. So that's why it's a kilogram meters per second. That's the units for momentum. It seems like a strange thing, like an arbitrary thing. But it turns out in a lot of times in, in physics, uh, or even in general science, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find some quantities that are conserved. And when I say conserved, I mean same before as after. Now, mass is often conserved, but not quite, right? It turns uh, out, you know, E equals MC squared. Mass goes missing and gets turned into energy and weird stuff there. Velocity isn't necessarily conserved from before to after. But somebody figured out that if you multiply mass and velocity, just that product of mass and velocity, that thing we call momentum, that thing that's kind of arbitrary, that is conserved. So that's what we use. That's the reason why it's a useful unit, okay? Because momentum itself by on its own doesn't really mean much to us. It's a product of mass and velocity. Yes, yeah, so what? Well, the reason why it's important is because of this idea here that it's conserved, which means the momentum before, like the total momentum before, will equal the total momentum after. And you use this to make predictions. You can use this to solve all sorts of crazy problems. So this is the main idea behind momentum conservation. So uh, I'm going to give you an example here. I just went skiing recently, so that's why I was thinking about this. But I mean, it's uh, very much set up like an IB question. I just changed the skier and snowboarder. But I mean, the idea is an IB idea here. They definitely do this. Um, so let's just split everything. I like to split the question into two here. So we have a skier, mass of the skier is 55 kilograms and they run into a snowboarder of 70 kilograms. They have an inelastic collision. Do you know what inelastic means? Inelastic means they don't bounce. In other words, they stick together. Okay? They stick together, that's the important thing here. Inelastic means they stick together. Now, what's their final velocity after the collision, assuming no friction? And we're given that the skier, remember S means skier, is 20 meters per second east, and we have the snowboarder going 30 meters per second west. So I think maybe it helps to draw uh, something here. So let's just try to draw this. I'm not a good artist. So I'm just going to say this is going to be the skier. And it's going to be M skier is 55 kilograms. And I have V skier is, what was it again? It was 20. So 20 meters per second. And I'll draw east being that way, just to the right. Uh, now I'm going to draw the snowboard. This is the snowboard over here. They're going to the left, by the way. We're going to say the mass of the snowboarder is 70 kilograms. I'm just lining everything up just so it's going to be a lot easier to deal with. Uh, and the velocity of the snowboarder is 30 meters per second. Now, what's really important then is, again, if you want to figure out what happens, I mean, in the end here, they stick together. We have this person and we have the skier here. Right? They're stuck together somehow. So maybe they're sort of tangled and they're angry with each other. Uh, now, we don't know what necessarily which direction they're going to be going. We're going to have to figure that out. But um, we want to know their final velocity. And a good way to do that is, again, to calculate what is the thing that's conserved. And obviously, you should know it since it's a video about momentum. Duh, he's probably going to use a momentum example. But this is an example where we need momentum. So let's uh, actually find it here. So I'll try to solve for momentum here. I'll say, um, we're doing them in the same colors maybe. So I have momentum of the skier. Well, the momentum is just mass times velocity. So it's just 55 times 20. Uh, so that's 100, no, 110 with an extra zero there. Kilogram, 
meters per second. And that is in the direction of the travel, so that's that way. But now we also have the P of the snowboarder, the momentum of the snowboarder. Let's figure that out. That is uh, 70 times 30, which is 21 with two extra zeros. Uh, so this is this number here, have I done? yeah, kilogram meters per second. But this is that way, it's left. Now, it helps to figure out what's the total momentum then. Total momentum, I'll see P total. It's just going to be the momentum of the snowboarder plus the momentum of the skier. In this case, then I have to do 2100 and 1100, and they're opposite directions. So I know the one that's going to win is the snowboarder. So 2100 minus 1100. That's going to give me a thousand. So what I'm going to do then with that number thousand, I have to keep in mind which direction it is. So that gives me a direction to the left. And this is the only thing that's allowed to cross that line. What I mean by that line, that line is going to define before the collision and after the collision. So that way, the only thing that can cross this line, the only thing that's useful, the only thing that's conserved is this total momentum. So now I know that this total momentum is also equal to this same number right here. So now I know that. So maybe I'll write it in a totally different color now. Now I know then that P total is equal to 1,000 here as well. I even know the direction. It's to the left or west, sorry, west. Um, so what happens here? Well, they're both stuck together. Well, now I know they're both going that way. And what I can do is figure out, well, I know the momentum equals the mass times the velocity, but I know that they're together, so it's going to be m1 plus m2. So in other words, it's going to be um, 55 plus 70, all that times um, the final velocity, which I don't know. Remember, I, I'm actually trying to find that. So I'm going to actually take a look at that and uh, try to do it all here. I can actually uh, put in for pt here. I've got 1,000. So that's going to equal, because uh, that's my total uh, momentum. I know that 1,000 uh, equals this plus this times V. So that means that 1,000 divided by 55 plus 70, uh, that's going to equal V. So I'm going to get out my trusty calculator here and see if I can solve this. So I've got uh, 55, what do I have to do? I have to do 1,000 over, what was that, 125. I end up with 8. So my velocity then is 8 meters per second and it's left so in other words it's west that's what's going to happen that's going to be the total velocity or sorry the velocity of both of them together so that's how you can use this to solve things uh, now comes something really important which is impulse it's something that a lot of students i think really struggle with you have an equation for it you're actually told impulse this is in your data book look, impulse equals uh, how does it go it goes uh, f delta t equals, um, is it m delta v or do they give you delta p? Ah, I think they just say delta p. You have to know that it's that. Here we go. This is the impulse equation. You get this in your data booklet. It looks just like this. So what does this mean? Well, impulse then is a change in momentum. That's the key thing. Okay, so impulse is a change in momentum. Oops, oh no. I got my pen out. There you go. It's a change in momentum. So if the momentum changes, then there's been an impulse. Now, the important thing is this force and uh, delta t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw myself a graph of f and delta t. An impulse is really like a kick or a push or something like this. So I imagine like, you know, if I kicked, uh, I don't know, a ball, then I would impart a force on that ball in a short amount of time. See that? So therefore, um, you can calculate then what the impulse is. So the way the impulse works is, I mean, this graph might be actually a weird shape. It might do some strange shape, like, I don't know, it's a common one that they like to use in IB, like that. Like a nice sort of shape like this. And the question is, like, how do I find the impulse from just this one graph? And that brings up what I think is maybe one of the most useful things I'm going to show you, maybe in this whole course, is what to do if you're stuck and you have a graph. So this is an example here. This shows up all over the place. I use this trick pretty much everywhere. Whenever I'm not sure what to do, I just do this and it almost always saves the day. So here's what you do. When you're stuck and you have a graph, so let's say I'm looking at a graph. I don't know what this is, okay? It doesn't even matter what it is. It could be any sort of shape. It can be anything. We have this thing uh, called Y, whatever that is, and it's got units of Y. Like, I don't know what, whatever units. We have some 
thing x and it's got units of x. So this could be like a force in this case, force which has units of newtons and delta t which has units of seconds, for example. Um, then you can figure out what to do here. So if you're not sure what to do with a graph, there's only three things you could really do with it. You could either read a value directly. So what I mean by that is let's say you take an X thing, you go up here, then you go over there and get the Y value or vice versa, take the Y value, read it down, go to the X. You can either read the value directly or you could be using the gradient. If you use the gradient of something, remember that means you have to take a tangent line and then you actually find the gradient of that line. The units of gradient, keep this in mind, the units of gradient will have because remember how gradient goes? Gradient is, isn't it, uh, rise over run? So isn't that equal to delta y over delta x? Like, you know, you have to say take some sort of, like let's say with this right here. I would take some sort of gradient right here. And now I'd find out, you know, what was the delta y? What was the delta x? I could measure that. Well, I could do it right here. If I was wondering something right here. I could take the gradient, but keep in mind what units it'll have. The units it'll have will be units of y divided by units of x. So to have those units. In this case, if I did the gradient of this bad boy over here, I would have, let's see, newtons per second. So in that case, it would be newtons per second. That's one other option. And the last option is you could take the area under the curve. So what I mean by that is you might actually, uh, I don't know, maybe from here to here, maybe take the area under the curve right here. So the area is going to have uh, units of, because of course you do length times width, right? You do... Um, I should do area equals x times y, which in this case right here, then you can say that the area then will have units of whatever x was times whatever y was. In other words, these units, y times x. It'll have those units. So I basically look at the units to tell me what to do. So if I'm looking for a question and I'm sort of, they'll often give you a hint in the IB about what kind of things you're looking for. I just take a guess and see, does this get me closer to what I need or farther? So in this case, look at this carefully then. If I've got impulses F times delta T, multiplying a thing times a thing, is that a reading a value directly, gradient, or area under the curve? I hope you can see area under the curve is multiplying, isn't it? So you can then state with this that the impulse, because it's equal to F delta T, that's this thing times this thing, you could then say it's the area under uh, the curve of uh, F versus T. And what units will it have? You could say that impulses units will be, let's see, newtons times seconds. So you can say impulse will have units of newton seconds. You could also have, say it has kilogram meters per second, but this is another unit. So you can also say that impulse has units of this. This is really important. So I hope this is going to really help you out to decode some of this strange stuff.